This is the FYI on Youth Ministry, a youth ministry podcast from the Fuller Youth Institute. This season, we are focusing on discipleship that cultivates Christ-like characteristics. Things like humility, forgiveness, love, perseverance, hope, and compassion. In today's episode, we want to name historical social injustices related to character development. We'll also talk about practical ways we can safeguard our teaching from unintentionally causing harm. But first, let's hear from the young people about today's topic. My name is Samantha. I am 14 years old. My name is Debbie. I am 17 years old. Have you ever had an uncomfortable experience when someone was teaching you or talking about being like Jesus? like pressured, judged, shamed, or misunderstood? Usually when people talk to me like about anything like religious, I usually just find it as a way like, oh, this is their perspective on how they see things that I don't see it. So I usually use it as a learning experience rather than like finding it in any way like uncomfortable. I think it'll be more with forgiveness. That forgiveness will come out, will come slowly, not like that fast. Because if you forgive someone like nothing, you don't mean it. And when you're forgiving them little by little, you're actually meaning it. Hey, hey, everyone. This is Rosalind Hernandez, and I am the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager and Content Producer here at the Fuller Youth Institute. And my co-host today is Brad. Hey, Rosalind. And hey, everybody, I'm Brad Griffin. I'm Senior Director of Content and Research at the Fuller Youth Institute. And I'm excited that we're going to have this conversation today. You know, one of the things that we talk about that youth workers care about is the character of their students, how they're being formed, how they're living out Christ-likeness or whatever kinds of words we might use in their everyday lives. And in the last episode um, in this series, we kind of set the stage with background about the Character and Virtue Development Research Project here at FYI and introduced six specific characteristics that we will be talking about in this season. And in today's episode, we're going to pick up there and we're going to talk about some of the historical aspects of character development, including some of the dark sides of that history. Unfortunately, character and virtue language have been misused at points in U.S. history and global history and particularly used to oppress people of color. And so we want to not just name that, we are naming it, but we also want to think about practical ways we can support our students, especially students from affected communities, and to safeguard our teaching from unintentionally causing harm. So that's where we are today. I'm excited about that. Yeah, and I'm really excited because we have one of our partners here at Fuller, whom I've been really wanting to do something, like do a collaboration with, and today we finally get to to do that. So our partner for this conversation is Reverend Dr. Robert Chao Romero, and Robert identifies as Asian Latino. He's a professor of Chicana and Chicano Studies um, at University of California, Los Angeles, and he's also an attorney and an author, and some of his recent books include Brown Church, Five Centuries of Latina Latino Social Justice, Theology and Identity, and his forthcoming book is Christianity and Critical Race Theory, A Faithful and Constructive Conversation. Robert also brings the experience of being a father uh, to young people. Robert, thanks so much for being with us today. Excited to be with my Fuller family. Yeah. (laughs) So um, we're going to dive into the research and we're going to dive into the history. But before we get into that, um, let's get a little bit personal. Do you remember a time when a young person taught you something about character or particularly Christ-like character? I remember about four years ago, um, I had the privilege of working with uh, the Matthew 25 movement when we were working with churches around around issues of immigration. And at that time, there was a, a, a Latino pastor, Pastor Noe Carillas, and he was threatened with unjust deportation. And he had two young kids. And I remember 
just watching his kids during as this was all going on and he was arrested by ice and there was a nas- national like prayer vigil for him and and his children i remember seeing their um suffering unfortunately and sort of their their realistic sort of experience of that suffering but also their faith and i'll never forget that on on pastor noe's uh, daughter's birthday that was the day that pastor noe was released and in fact she was at disneyland and it was like god breaking through you know saying i see what you're going through and and this is going to be a very special birthday for you wow that's that's such a great story of of faith that young people sometimes we <laughs> we think that young people especially like younger kids right that they don't understand as much about cross like characteristics but there's something so meaningful about the innocence and that pure faith that young kids can have that they were taught you know like God can do this, like God does great things and God is with you and they believe it. And that's the faith that they operate from. That's so, that's so powerful. Yeah. Thanks for that story. You know, Robert, today's topic can feel a little bit like an elephant in the room when it comes (laughs) to Christian education, youth ministry, you know, kind of anything in our, in our realm. Um, So through our research, We've learned more about how virtue and character formation and even just that language are connected to just some darker moments in our history. Um, we saw this in, you know, in education research and his, history um, and in our interviews even, you know, with youth leaders and some of the ways they talk about some of this. And so thinking about, you know, most of the people who are listening to this podcast are involved in some kind of leadership role with young people, youth work of of all kinds. Um, But often in churches or, you know, parachurch, neighborhood ministries, that kind of thing. So why is it important for them to know this context? I think that um, virtue and character development is tied in in a very important way to identity, to identity development. And um, sometimes I've seen it in churches where character development, virtue development can address certain ethnic communities from a cultural deficit lens, a cultural deficit lens. So it's like, it might, might be implicit, but it's there. Let me give you an example. I remember when I was a young Christian and, and I found this God used this one church to really help me come to know God, and my life was being transformed by Jesus. I was at a, at a Wednesday night Bible study, and we were we were studying like I don't know it was like First First Peter or something, and I'll never forget the teacher at the Bible study made an off the hand comment and said the senior pastor told him that Mexican Americans in Texas that the husbands just always left their families. And so most Mexican American families have no dad. And that's why the culture is so messed up. (laughs) Right. And at that point in time, I was just flabbergasted. Like I knew that that was wrong. My family's Mexican American from Texas. Right. (laughs) And, and, and I think that, so in that context, in that Bible study, the person who was teaching the Bible study was trying to communicate Christ-like virtues and values you know, from Peter's list, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. And yet was not aware of the cultural deficit perspective that he was um, projecting upon me, a young Christian. Yeah, that's painful. Wow. Yeah, and, and a really... Yeah, painful and poignant example of how youth leaders can maybe not even be aware of the kind of pain they're inflicting on young people, um, you know, because of their assumptions, their biases, or even what just what they've learned that's just wrong. You're somebody who has spent a lot of time studying history, Robert, and we want to like we want to tap into that, (laughs) you know, I wonder if you could give us a couple of brief examples of when 
character and virtue formation were weaponized against people of color in our country in particular. And I want to make sure, Rajan, you're going to maybe say something, but I can... Just really quickly, I think that sometimes it's even more important for youth leaders to be aware of our thinking because it's the the people that young people spend the most time with um, in church. And it's the people that have the most influence over a young person's faith. And so being aware of how we see other cultures and the perspective that we're coming from is really important. And, and like in the example that I mentioned, imagine, you know, I was a, well, I was a younger person. I wasn't a youth at that time, although I was still a youth in the Latino context, which goes up to 50. <laughs> <laughs> right. But imagine like, you know, my, my identity is forming. I'm a young Christian. I'm loving Jesus. I'm feeling God's love. That would communicate to me that, being Latino is, is somehow bad. It's the less Christian thing. So I should try to be like the pastor who's Anglo-American from Texas. And I would become ashamed to bring my cultural identity and my culture into the church space. I have one very specific example that will really bring this home. The U.S. was facing a labor shortage because about 100 years ago, the U.S. banned immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, as well as from Asia. So Italy, Greece, Russia, Poland, all of Asia, like it banned immigration from those places. So all of a sudden there was a labor shortage. And so Mexican immigrants became recruited to the United States in places like California and Texas to fill that labor gap. But at the time, Mexican, Mexican immigrants were, as well as Italian immigrants and others were viewed as culturally deficit, just like, like my previous example, like viewed as not measuring up culturally to the dominant cultural group. And so the U.S. government, in partnership with churches, created what were called Americanization programs. As part of these Americanization programs, again, churches partnered with the U.S. government to not only teach immigrants, Mexican immigrants and others, about American um, values and character development and things like that. But they they operated on the assumption that Mexican culture, that Italian culture, these different cultural groups were culturally inferior. And so they taught immigrants to shed their God-given cultures and to become Americanized. And that implied that that your culture that you that you brought is somehow inferior and your language is inferior, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so that, that was a very explicit example of the weaponization of virtue and character development. And it was all throughout the United States, including here in Pasadena, even involved with, with even churches in, in Southern California. I think that as academics and researchers, um, we can give our listeners a really long list of things to read and <laughs> um, movies to watch in order for them to learn more about this history that some of these examples like you just shared. Um, and we do have something like that, so you can check our show notes page for that. But um, a, a lot of the way that we learn is also relational. We learn from our students and from their families. And Robert, I think un unpacking a couple of terms that you write about in Christianity and critical race theory can help us understand how we can learn from our students and their families. You mentioned the significance of experiential knowledge and communal cultural wealth. Can you give us brief explanations of these terms? So first I would kind of um, point us to John's words in the book of Revelation, verse chapter 21, verse 26. And in that passage, to remind ourselves, John is describing what's going to happen when Jesus comes back and Jesus makes all things new. What are some images that we can take away, some ideas to be able to understand what, what that's going to be like? And in verse 26, John says, the glory and honor of the nations will be brought in. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought in. That word glory is from the Greek doxa, which can be translated treasure and wealth. So at the end of all time, when Jesus renews all things, finally, 
the cultural treasure and wealth of the different ethnic groups of the world will be brought in to the city of God forever of eternal value, right? So let's say you're working with students, whatever their ethnic background is, they possess and their families, their mothers, their fathers, their grandparents, they, th those communities possess distinct doxa, distinct community cultural treasure and wealth that is for the benefit of the church, that's for the benefit of the United States. And to bring this back to, to our the previous example of, of Americanization programs, those Americanization programs assumed that only one ethnic group had glory and honor. And so this is reclaiming the biblical truth that no, by God's grace, <laughs> All of our families bring this distinct community cultural wealth that is for the benefit of the church. Thanks. So as a professor working with young people, how do you honor their experiential knowledge and communal cultural wealth? Or how can a youth leader honor their students' experiential knowledge and communal cultural wealth? Well, I think of an example from class last week. And... One student said, thank you for allowing not only us to share our perspectives, but to recognize that they are valid. Because in other classes, that's not, it's not the case, right? In other classes, like the model of teaching is sort of the students are empty vessels and it, it's the job of the professor to just pour in you know, water into their head or something, right? Knowledge, right? And so I think one way in which I learn it's just by listening. And that's indeed like as a professor at UCLA, that's how I've learned like at least half of what I know is because I, I'd be teaching a, a lesson on say immigration and the law and I'll be teaching these legal cases and then students would share their stories about their families, right? Or I'd be teaching about public health and then a student shares the story about how their family do not have health care, and that type of experiential knowledge that's, it's, it's critical. So to, to hear from the people who are actually experiencing the issue, that's how I try, not, not always successfully, but I try to, to, to honor that. And, and I, I've learned so much. I think that sometimes, as you mentioned, right, we think that like, oh, we're youth leaders, we're supposed to have the answers. I kind of see this kind of teaching and learning as like God being in the center and all of us being around and and everyone brings a different perspective and there's no way that one person can see all of who God is or all of how God is working. And we can't understand that unless we hear the other perspectives from people that are looking at God's work through their lives from different points of view. Amen. Yeah. We can forget at how radical the concept of the body of Christ is and that we truly do belong to one another and we truly do need one another. Just to reinforce too that all, all ministry, all discipleship is contextual. It happens in a place and among a people. And if we're not really listening and paying attention to those people in that place, we're we're missing something. Um, you know, to go back to your earlier example, you know, youth leaders are never just pouring objective truth into empty vessels <laughs> you know all, all, all of that is coming filtered through their own their own subjective lens and cultural location and experiences and education and whatever else that is you know as well as going into this dynamic environment of their students and, the, and their backgrounds and their families and um, I mean to me that makes ministry all the more exciting to think about how God might bring even a particular Bible passage alive in a particular moment, given who's there, you know, who, who's in the room, what, what kids showed up and, and what adults are there and, and what, what are the collective stories that are being brought to the table? I mean, I can think of an example of that that gets me excited. I remember hearing from a colleague, um, her interpretation of, of, of the current immigration moment and scripture. I think it was Karen Gonzalez, I think, and she talked about how Moses was the first 
unaccompanied minor. Mm. <laughs> Moses was the first unaccompanied minor. In other words, like, you know, his mom, you know, was under threat of, of, of her son dying because of the decree of Pharaoh to kill all the, all the, all the, the newborn boys. So her mother released her into the Nile in this tar pitch basket, right? Not knowing what was going to, but not knowing what was going to happen to him, and God worked, and God worked, and, and I remember, you know, those kinds of insights. I, I could read those passages like a thousand times, a million times, and never get that insight. And I think that imagine multiply that across the experience of the whole body of Christ, and it, it's a beautiful treasure. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful treasure. And on top of that, to, to kind of in a bigger picture, like how God's most active movement in global Christianity now is among immigrants and in the global South, right? Africa, Asia, Latin America. That's where, that's where the Holy Spirit is on fire, right? In the Western context, the church is unfortunately on a decline. I feel like God is, can redeem the church, can renew the church in the United States through, through all that glory and honor that is literally being brought to our doorstep. That's powerful. I, you mentioned Karen Gonzalez, and we, yeah, maybe we can link to her new book in our show notes too, because um, she's got a great, great uh, new book out around what that sort of welcome can look like. And yeah, I want to keep going on this theme too around families. So, from the youth leader and parent perspective, just wondering how we can recognize and invite that knowledge and cultural wealth of parents and families, family groups into our ministry practice as youth leaders. We often get questions about parent engagement, you know, how do we how do we work with families? How do we communicate with families? What does it mean to minister to young people in the context of whatever that family environment is like? It sounds like there's an opportunity here to be intentional, more intentional about how we engage and honor parents and families. So just with that in mind, like when we teach about some of these Christ-like characteristics we're talking about, love, forgiveness, compassion, hope, humility, perseverance, what can youth leaders do to be hospitable to parents and families, maybe especially those who've been negatively impacted by some of those unjust language or practices or narratives that we've been talking about? I think that different ethnic communities have different family structures. And even within the same ethnic community, there's you know different family structures. But so for example, to address the first part of, of, your, of your question, in many Latina, Latino families, religious instruction is passed on through the matriarchs, through the mothers, through the grandmothers, right? And there's a concept called abulita theology, abulita theology, which comes from Latino theology that says that, yeah, in, in many Latino families, we might not have like someone who got their MDiv at Fuller, but we have our, our, our grandmother, our abuela and our aunts and our mothers who, are that vital source of faith. Basically, basically, women are kind of like the pastors of the family, right? And so I think there's there's an opportunity to think through the way youth ministry is done, for example, in a Latino context that integrates the family unit. Many families are looking for just, you know, like, like the passage states, the glory and honor of the nations. They were just looking for their 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 cultures to be honored. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> like, um, and I think to be able to build into youth ministry curriculum, you know, portions that, that really do recognize this positive theology of ethnicity. We all have distinct God-given ethnic community, cultural treasure and wealth. And then to create segments, for example, where youth can explore that, where, where it can be brought to their attention that they have glory and honor. Because again, the mess, the messages we that many of us hear on media and, and churches and everywhere is like, and both both directly and indirectly, we don't even know we have any honor or glory. So to I think to be able to get youth to think about that and, and then to welcome those perspectives into the conversation, I think that would go a long way to start. Yeah, I think about um, something that we've talked about before on the podcast, which are testimonios. 
um, testimonies and just like hearing stories, right, of people that have um, felt God's presence with them through difficult experiences or um, or just have a praise to give about how God's working in their life. And testimonials are something that uh, growing up in a Latina church was something that's part of the every Sunday almost, you know, and so it's um, maybe inviting families, inviting the hermanas, the abuelas, you know, the the mothers to come and talk about their story to the students might be one of the ways that something like perseverance could be or hope could be talked about. Yeah, I think of a story like I remember talking to one of my second cousins. <laughs> I have third cousins and I have lots of cousins. But <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I, I called her because my father was um, was ill and she was sharing, you know, that she was praying for him. And she shared different stories with me on a couple of occasions. She said, first of all, she said, every morning I pray for all of my uncles and aunts and cousins. And we're not talking like seven people there. That's probably like 80 people, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, I mean, my dad was miraculously healed, you know, through those prayers. She told me another story about how her heart, she was about to die and she was in the hospital and her heart was something really bad wrong with her heart. And people were praying for her. And literally the next day, her heart was fine. <laughs> and the doctors are like, we have no explanation but your heart is fine now. Those, that faith, that vital faith. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's, what's going to change youth. That's going to, that's, what's going to change us. That's what's going to change the church. These are great examples. And, and they tend to want to express those and want to talk about them. It's not like they, they're hiding their stories. Women, particularly in the Latina context, they want to share what's happened. They want to share how God's been working in their lives. Yeah, thanks for sharing those examples. So today, we're going to do a lightning round of questions. <laughs> so get ready. I feel like we need like one of those wah, 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 like some buzzers to like say, okay, lightning round time. <laughs> okay, so. I'm trying to think of the right sound effect for a lightning round. I don't know. <laughs> Some it's lightning making me scared. thunder. It's making me scared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Um, yeah, so these questions are actually inspired by the questions that we asked the youth leaders in our research project. And there are no right or wrong answers, so don't get scared. It's okay. We're looking for the first thing that pops into your head. One word, one sentence, zero to no context. Zero to little context, depending on, you know, on what the answer is. All right, are you ready? Okay, let's do it. Okay. When you were a teenager, who taught you most about love? My mom. What is the greatest lesson you've learned about forgiveness? That I need to be forgiven just as much as anybody else. And uh, we all need to receive and give grace. In this season of your life, compassion looks like? Just hanging in there. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like like waking up and still like you know visiting my brother and still just being able to just keep on trucking that's what compassion looks like what or who gives you hope my kids my son and daughter this is kind of a trick question but it's still fun <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 10 1 being low and 10 being high how <laughs> much humility do you have <laughs> That's a trick one. <laughs> Six. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Um, and That's so when, unfair, Rosalind. I know it is. <laughs> we can give you a one sentence answer if you want to <laughs> talk about that. Are you serious or are you just joking? No, you can, you can, you can go ahead and say something about your six. <laughs> I think that like, because I, I grew up with like such low self-esteem from like so many different ways that it, it's in a certain ways, it's easy for me to sort of be humble. But be, because of those experiences, of those experiences growing up at the same time, I can be very insecure. Right. So it's kind of like, um, 
Yeah. And, and I think at the same time, like, you know, with certain amount of like, you know, you know, you know, your name kind of gets out there like with books and stuff, it's easy to get a puffed up head. Right. And I think, but I think it's, it's really important to uh, like, it's like a spiritual discipline to stay humble. You know, I think that's like super key. Cause I can tell you stories of like crazy stuff that I come across where people just are so jealous and this and that, and like say crazy stuff. And so I, I by God's grace, I hope that I can, um, I, ble I bless them and I hope that I can, you know, be, be okay at the, doing that. Okay. The last one, here he goes. When something is hard, what is a practice that helps you persevere? Well, other than going and eating a cheeseburger, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a, it's a going on a walk with my wife. Yeah. You know, we just like, take the dogs and we'll just put on some some chunk gloves or like sandals and just walk around the block and just keep walking and keep talking and then the stress comes out and get the process that's a really awesome practice yeah yeah that's good so in this season we're asking our guests to help us wrap each episode with a blessing so robert in light of our conversation here can you give us a benediction today I'd be so honored. Sure. Lord Jesus, thank you that, that you are our model, Lord, of character, of, of virtue, of compassion, of justice, of mercy, of forgiveness. Lord, I ask that you would bless the FYI community and all, all who are listening, Lord, and draw us closer to you and transform us, Lord, to be more like you. In your name, amen. Mm, amen. Amen. Thank you. This was such a, I think, helpful conversation for not just us. Like we, we were really impacted by the stuff, the stories that you shared. But I think it'll also be really helpful for our listeners. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the privilege of, of being able to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. This podcast is one of the many free resources produced by the Fuller Youth Institute. Check out the show notes for links to all the resources mentioned in today's episode. And finally, here is one final thought from a young person. One of the characteristics I think I can like link to my parents is being compassionate. Compassion and love. My parents and I have always talked about doing things for my future. They want me to have a better future than what they had. They want me to have like a better career. They want me to like do everything that they can have done because they're immigrants. You know, they, they weren't given a chance to like do some things because they're like from a, like a different place. They came here to America for us, for my family, for their kids. And so because of that, they've like developed like such like a very strong love for me and my siblings everything they've done for me was like out of love and like just compassion. A lot of those like characteristics can be linked to like the Asian community in general because we've been like through so much. But um, regardless of like what culture you're from, anyone can like develop those like characteristics. I know I have, I know my parents have, I know my family has,